welcome to the Unconstrained Podcast. Today I have an uh, absolute uh, joy. I am joined by the expert in finance, Lynette Zhang, who is kind of somebody, I have a bit of a hero to me. Uh, Lynette oh. is a very popular YouTuber, but more importantly, she's the financial uh, market analyst. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. At, at uh, ITM Trading. And so with that, I'm going to introduce Lynette. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Miles. I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're great. We're happy to have you. I think just for my listeners who aren't aware of your work, if you could just give us a bit of a background as to who Lynette is and, and how you arrived at where you've arrived. Oh, absolutely. Because the truth is, is I have been groomed for this moment in time. And I've been in these markets on some level. And this is probably going to freak a lot of people out. But 1964. Uh, when I was 10 years old because uh, my uncle was a major antique dealer back east. And so I learned a lot of how tangible assets move through uh, trends and through phases. But I also started in banking because my father was a developer in a small town in New York. So, um, you know, he, he was kind of a medium-sized fish in a little pond. So I got to start in banking when I was 15, study business finance uh, at your daughter's now alma mater, I guess, the U of A, and uh, became a stockbroker in 86. So I was there on Black Monday, and I've been here at ITM since 2002. So between my banking, my, my understanding of tangible markets and trends, and then the banking aspect, as well as the stock brokering aspect, means that I understand how what, what they're talking about when they're talking in circles, intentionally, by the way, to speak Wonderful. in circles. Wonderful. All right. Well, this, this is it. I, I've been trying to send a message to people through our podcast about uh, being able to detach yourself from the shackles of debt, from the shackles of the overlords, and to become unconstrained. And it seems that this week is a particularly interesting one because we're seeing substantial stock market drops and economic crises and so on. So I wanted to start off by just getting a, a general sense of your observation of what's happened this week. What, what do you see going on in the markets? Well, actually what I see is the end of a long-term trend. And I would like to back up a little bit before we move forward because if you don't understand the foundation of the problem, you're not really going to understand the problem. And the problem that we're really dealing with is about the currency that we work for and we use and we try and invest in the markets or wherever else we invest them. And so I need to take you back in history because we needed a way to enable society to specialize. So you could have a doctor, you could have a lawyer, you could have a baker, you could have a banker, etc. And we needed a tool that we could value that labor out and then also use it as a tool of barter. So over the last 6,000 years, I mean, gold has been money since 560 AD. That's when the first gold coin was created, which is still in existence because gold is indestructible. But uh, when they were looking at how to create that money, then a key was they wanted that money to hold value over time so that you work, you get, your, you get paid your money, you go out and spend it. But if you're going to save some of it, then you're always fairly paid for your labor. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So while they tried lots and lots of things, only gold actually meets all of the criteria necessary to be a monetary instrument. Um, it, is, it is indestructible. So we can account for pretty much all of the gold that was ever mined. Now, silver does get used up in industry, but gold does not. So therefore, it was a perfect accounting tool, and they couldn't really skew its value so much. It's also easily divisible. So you can have a tenth of an ounce, you can have a half an ounce, you can have a qu three quarters, you can have an ounce, whatever, but it doesn't lose its value like diamonds. If you take a big diamond and you cut it in half, 
well, it loses a lot of value. But with gold, you simply melt it down, whatever form it's in, it can be in jewelry, it can be in any form at all, and you simply melt it down, it's monetary at its base, and it doesn't lose value because you've divided it in half or a quarter or what have you. So there are many qualities, plus it takes labor to pull gold out of the ground and refine it. So when we were on a gold standard, what you were actually doing was trading your labor for someone else's labor, which is a pretty fair way to do it. For governments though, the problem is what do they wanna do? They wanna tax and spend. And if you're on a gold standard, well, there are restrictions around their ability to do that. And if they tax you, you know about it and you might not agree to it. So they came up with a new system. This is not a brand new system. Uh, over 6,000 years, a lot of different um, countries have tried what's called a fiat system. And fiat, the literal translation is by decree. So that's actually government legalized money. And frankly, if the government legalizes something, they can also say, oh, no longer money anymore, as we saw India do in 2016, as well as Venezuela, that demonetized something like 82, 87% of all of the money that was out there. But the advantage for governments because what they did was they baked inflation into the system. Now, if the goal of money is to maintain its value over time, the goal of fiat money is to decline in value over time. And the real experiment, and this is genius, really, back in 1913 when they put this system into place, the genius was that this was the first time historically when central bankers had attempted to control the rate and speed of the inflation. So in the past, you know, central bankers usually had um, a period of time where they were, where they were had a charter, and usually 15 to 20 years. And in that period of time, if a government went to war, well, they went off the gold standard, they hyperinflated the currency to pay for the war, war, they blamed it on the central bankers, they went back on a gold standard, and then there was a long period of time for people to forget. But since 1913, that's when they started this experiment where it is... Um, where they were controlling the rate and speed. And so when you're talking to central bankers who actually do not work for their government, that is a private entity, but they, you may have heard, your listeners may have heard that they have a 2% inflation target. And what they're trying to do is reduce the value of the dollar in this country, reduce the value of the dollar by 2%, over the course of a year. Why? Well, because you're not going to notice 2%. You know, if, if gas goes up one penny, you're not going to really pay much attention to it. So, however, that still means that after a period of time, you lose all value in the currency. So right now, officially, anybody can go on the Federal Reserve website, FRED. We can send you a link or, uh, you know, that's easy enough to do. You can Google it. Um, you'll see that officially, out of the original dollar's worth of purchasing power, that there's only 3.89 cents worth of purchasing power value left in the currency. And for anybody that pays even a teeny bit of attention, what does the central bankers tell you? What do they tell you? We need more inflation, right? They keep saying, we've got to inflate our way, we can't hit our inflation target, blah, blah, blah. What they're actually telling you is that the dollar is overvalued and they are taking it down, right? Their goal is to reduce its value even more. So here's, here's an example. If I went into your house every single day for 30 years and I took one button, 
you're probably going to not miss those buttons. You're going to notice it, but it's not that big a deal. It's one button. But if I go into your house tonight and take 98% of every button that's in your house, you're going to notice that tomorrow. So it's the speed at which they do it that it's that frog in the pot of water when they turn up the heat, you know, oh, it's a nice warm bath, but then over time the frog is cooked and that's where we are. So when we're looking at the markets and where we are right now, I would say the frog is cooked. 1913 was the begin beginning. And if you, if you pay any attention at all, you will hear that the central bank is, admit themselves that they are out of tools to fight the next crisis. And that crisis has already begun. Aha. Uh -huh. And does that represent the over-exaggeration in the markets of how they've, they've seen this and what they think the future looks like? Well, are you, are you referring to the huge swings in, in volatility where you've got the stock market moving a thousand or so points yes. on a daily basis? Yeah. Um, what, back in 1913, and, and again, this is a graph that anybody, I think anybody can pull this up. If you go to stockcharts.com and you put in a dollar sign and T-Y-V-I-X, dollar sign TYVIX. That is the Treasury Volatility Index. And if you go back to when they first created this index, which was, I think, 2003, I could be off a little bit, but I'll be pretty close. 2003, what you'll see, because it indicates uh, the movement of uh, the 10-year Treasury bond, which I should say first, that is the foundation of the global markets, is the 10-year treasury, okay? And you'll see that it's just a dash, right, in the beginning, just a dash. And that's because the price of the treasury just didn't move much on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the foundation of a system. You don't want that to move much. You want it to be rock solid. When we hit 2008, the financial crisis, the... I can prove it, and if you watch my videos, you'll see that. But the system actually died. The system that we knew died in 2008. And the central bankers began to massive amount of experimentation to try and cover up, not correct, uh, what caused it, because it's actually gotten a lot bigger now, but to cover it up and buy them time to transfer the risk from the few, from the elites, to the public, to the many, okay? Um, and so you've, I'm sure your listeners have heard that they're counting on the consumer, they're counting on that. Mm -hmm. Well, as I've been watching and reporting over these years, I believe that enough risk has been transferred. You look at what the insiders are doing for themselves, and they've been getting out like rats deserting a sinking ship. Okay, so as long as the cover-up was, was, um, was, I guess, as long as they were covering up for the few, it was cheap enough to do that with all of that massive amount of money printing, which is why the buy-the-dip strategy, why this whole thing has worked so well since really 71 when, when central bankers took control. But when you look at that VIX, instead of that flat line, that it was before that, now you start to see a little bit of up and down movement, meaning that the price of the treasury bond was starting to shift as the world was shifting into this new era. In 2013, the VIX started looking like an EKG, right? So if you were looking at an EKG, you would say, this person is having a heart attack. And uh, that's the volatility index. And what that really tells you is that the markets have now been turned over to traders, right? So it's gone into what they would call hot money. So if you ever you hear that phrase, hot money, that means it goes in fast and it comes out fast. Okay, because what do traders care about? They don't care about the foundation. They just care about picking up a little bit of money. So I would say that that is a huge indication 
that we are at the end of this great experiment and you're seeing now that same kind of volatility in the stock market meaning that you know it used to be don't fight the fed well the fed ain't fighting the traders right now the whole system is completely financialized which means that wall street is more important than main street right and so the system is breaking so the, we have a very large number of our listeners who are effectively trying to retire early they're trying to break free of the shackles of the debt, which has been bestowed upon them since probably the age of 18 when they took student loans out to go to college. And it's a very difficult path for them to follow, but they are living frugally. They are saving a huge amount of their, of their earnings, sometimes as much as 50 or 70%. And it seems like the, the promise, the hope that they could take that money, they could invest it in some form, they could generate massive amounts of wealth and then eventually retire on the dividends coming from that very wealth, that that seems to be almost like a lost cause now. That in a bull market, it was, it was an active and possible scenario. But now that we're seeing markets turn as they do, um, it, what is your opinion in regards to the viability of doing something like that today? Well, I actually think it's extraordinarily viable. It just depends on the instrument or the asset that you're using to accomplish that. Because what's really happened in the stock markets with all of this money printing is the markets became severely overvalued. And they're still overvalued right now, even though we've had this 20% drop or 19% drop from the all-time highs. So trying to do that and putting your wealth into an overvalued market is basically a recipe for catastrophe because one thing I can guarantee you about trends is that they repeat, right? So whenever something is severely overvalued, it's going to go back to its fair valuation. Um, additionally, I just want to point out that if what you're looking at is the stock market or the bond markets or anything that you can only buy with dollars and convert back into dollars, then, then what's happening in the stock and bond market is not the real trend. What's happening, the real trend is in what's happening to the currency. And like I said, we've gone officially, you can go into the Federal Reserve and look at it yourself. We've gone from a dollar's worth of purchasing power to less than four cents, and it's not enough. They're telling you they're taking it down. So if you if you position your wealth into dollar denominated intangible assets, then it's going away. And and there's lots of evidence to that. You know, we're right now, I think they're going to hyperinflate, print lots of money, create lots more credit, let a lot more people go into debt. And that will probably push the stock markets up. Venezuela's had the best stock market, I think, since 2012 in the world, right? But their currency buys nothing. It has more value as an empanada. So what I think that people really need to do is deter, and I actually think this is always the case. You need to determine of anything that you're going to position into, what is its true fundamental value? Not what do they tell you, what, what does Wall Street want you to think, but what is that value? And you get that by looking at the most important function that it was created to perform for its creators. You know, not what you want it to do, but, you know, who created it? Why did they create it? They might, there might be lots of reasons, but, but you need to determine what is the single most important reason that it was created. For gold, for money, forget gold, but for money, the single most important reason why money was created was to hold its value over time. And gold has 6,000 years of history proving that. Regardless of the paper, action up and down. If you had one ounce of gold in 560 BC, you could buy a great suit of armor. In the 1900s, you could have bought a nice man suit with one ounce of gold, a $20 gold piece. Today, it's at like, where is it at? Somewhere around 1600 bucks an ounce. 
I'm pretty sure you can still buy a nice men's suit for 1600 bucks. So it's held its purchasing power value over time and it, it has done that. But with the dollar denominated assets, well, its most important function is to inflate its value away over time. So first of all, you have to be clear of what you're really looking at and what the most important function is. Now, for governments, the function of gold is it is completely intrinsic value. Even though they will tell you, ah, eh, it's an old relic, but it is used in every single area of the global economy. So it has the broadest base of demand now, I'm not saying that that won't shift. You go into a recession, demand's going to drop, what have you. But you have the broadest base of buyer. So, therefore, you have the most stable foundation for an investment. So, how do you know what it's worth? Well, since, since gold is one side of the money coin, fiat is the other side of the money coin, you got to look at how fiat money is created. And all those student loan debts and mortgage debts and credit card debts and all of that. In this system, since 1971, money has been created from debt. And what are we told supports that debt? The full faith and credit of the government. So let's just take a second and translate that. As long as you trust them, you have faith then you will continue to loan them money, extend them credit. So the foundation of the current monetary system is based upon the ability to grow a lot more debt. Well, let's see. Can you grow debt into the sky and never, ever, ever have to deal with the outcome of all of that debt? Because at the end of the day, you either have to pay it you have to roll it over or you have to default on it. You still have to deal with it. So that's where the system is right now. But to get the fundamental value of an ounce of gold, since the flip side is created from debt, you take all the debt in the world. And since there's a finite amount of gold, you divide it by how much gold there is. Because when they reset the system, which means they take us into a new financial monetary system, which they've been talking about. They revalue the fiat money that has no intrinsic value because it's only used in one place against gold, which is all intrinsic value because of its broad base of buyer. And that means that if they did the reset today, and this is super conservative, then you would see gold go to $10,000 an ounce. And, and wow. that's super conservative. That's actually ridiculously cheap. Right, right. So if it's, it's at sixteen hundred, it's a bargain. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, we've got a situation here where anybody who is looking to try to break free of the bonds of in, uh, maybe their employment, they're working at a job they hate, they're in, commuting an hour each way in traffic, they are sick of, they're not seeing their family. It, all the yeah. reasons, the, the, the complaints that we hear every day that's become the way of the West, unfortunately. Uh, with that situation going on and everybody punting on the idea of just saving a lot of money, that when they actually go to use that money, that its actual intrinsic value will be negligible compared to what they thought it was when they were earning it. Is that, is that a reasonable observation? Absolutely, because the moment that any money comes into your hand, it has the most value that it will in its lifetime because inflation is baked into the cake. But if you want to retire, I mean, this is my personal plan and it is just based upon repeatable patterns. So it's not rocket science. You can do your own due diligence and you'll see it. You want to have the lion's share of your wealth in an undervalued asset that is in a long-term positive trend and the least amount of your wealth in an overvalued instrument or asset that is in a long-term negative trend. Forget anything else you're looking at. Look at the value of the dollar. When you see something go downward like that, that's a negative trend. 
right. will see lower and lower highs. I don't care what you're looking at, but when you're technically, you'll see lower and lower highs, and then you know it's a negative trend, because if you keep getting lower highs, you'll get lower lows too. With gold, what you see when you look at it is a series of higher and higher lows. And that's how you know it's a positive trend. And in fact, well, there are lots of patterns, which is what I like to teach about on my YouTube channel. Um, because if you can recognize these patterns, then you can start to make those educated choices. So for those people that are um, really living frugally and saving, well, instead of going into an overvalued instrument, the stock market, when the insiders are getting out, you go into undervalued gold. Then what happens is these overvalued instruments, assets, real estate, all these things that can generate income, right now they've been targeted for reflation. So they're severely overvalued. This will flip flop, right? Now, those that don't, that can manage to survive, and there are a lot of corporations that have taken on an awful lot of debt that will not survive this. That's a, maybe a, for another day, but zombie corporations. However, once you let this, you let this whole trend take its class, you, your, its course rather, you just build up your position in both gold and silver because those are both severely undervalued to their fundamental value, okay? And then when these other assets, income producing assets drop and those rise, you take some of these gains and you position into it. For example, Japan in the early 90s, their commercial real estate dropped 95%. Wow. Right. And I mean, that, that's just one example. Uh, on, if you look at history, what you see is that on average, 25 ounces of gold or the equivalent would buy an entire city block, buildings and all. Okay, well right now, you know, it's, gold is severely undervalued. Accumulate it. You know, it's not for the rest of your life, it is, although you should always hold some gold because everybody should always hold some real money anyway. But depending upon where you are in the trend cycle would determine how much of your portfolio is held in there and the kind of gold and silver that you would hold in there because there are different kinds and they perform different functions. So depending upon what you're trying to, to accomplish. But so yes, the dream of creating enough wealth so that you can live the rest of your life is very, very real not in the stock market, not in, the, not in anything that is a purely a dollar denominated instrument because the dollar is going away. And that's not me saying it, that's the central bankers that control it saying it. We're destroying it. We need more inflation. No, I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, the one noticeable thing to me was that it seems like we have a, a, an economy and a world and a, and a fiscal policy that is completely serving those that are in debt. I mean, they're the ones getting the break on the interest payments and they're getting a, a cheap ride because they're carrying all this debt and the saver is getting screwed over it. The, the poor retiree out there isn't being able to cut it. I, I mentioned in a, a, probably in a previous podcast that I was in um, San Miguel uh, Diende in Mexico meeting up with a bunch of expats who were retirees down there and I had dinner with uh, a bunch of them and a gentleman who happened to be from Arizona was there. Um, he was, I guess, probably in his 70s. And I asked him, well, you know, why did you come to live to Mexico? And he goes, well, I just can't afford to live in the United States. I said, well, w w what, rent? And he says, yeah, my social security isn't cutting it. It's not enough to pay the rent. I can't, you know, get by. I can't pay my electric bill. Um, so I came here and I said, well, are you only relying on social security income? And he goes, no, no, I have a, a 401k, you know, with a couple of hundred thousand dollars in it. And I was thinking, well, wow, if you think about the average person retiring these days and how much money they're retiring with, he is the poster child of that. And mm -hmm. when I started realizing, I said to him, well, can you make money on your uh, 401k, on your investments? And he goes, well, 
No, I mean, I can't make any interest on it because if I put it in the bank, I'm lucky to get 0.09% interest on savings, and that's not enough to live on, even down here where the peso is 21 to 1. Um, but he said, um, no, I have to put it in the stock market. I said, why exactly. is that? He has no other choice. He, this is where yeah. his money is, and it's the only place that was performing. And, exactly. you know, that, that scares me. Well, your, your listeners should Google financial repression, which is a strategy by the central banks to make exactly what you talked about happen, happen. They push the interest. I mean, there are lots of reasons for them to push the interest rates down. This is a 30-year trend that is now at the end because they're discovering how far below zero you get to go. Um, but... You know, if he's counting on the 401k, which he is, and there are a lot of people, and actually, if he's got a couple hundred thousand, he's better than the he's better off than the average person, to be perfectly honest with you. But that is all denominated only in dollars, and so we know that we have globally a retirement crisis that started with my generation. So I'm probably the oldest person here amongst this, but I'm a baby boomer. And we started to retire in 2013, and Social Security, which is a pay-as-you-go system, meaning they they tax you in your paycheck, but you no matter what your age is, then if if I were a beneficiary of it, which which I'm not, I'm not collecting Social Security yet. But if I were, your deposits go to me, which means that's not for your retirement. That's for my retirement because the government, when there was excess, and there used to be, it, when they first started Social Security uh, back in, I think, the 30s, it was the early 30s, there were, um, don't hold me to this, but I'll be pretty close, 15.89 workers to support one beneficiary. The last time I looked, so it's probably, oh, I don't know, maybe a yearish ago or something like that, I think the data went through 2016 or something like that. There was uh, like 1.89 workers for every beneficiary. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. So if, if the whole system goes kaput and it's because of a coronavirus or something like that, right, then they can point the finger and say, not me, but it basically solves the problem of all of the retirement system because... That has no value anymore. Well, it, all, it also amplifies the issue that if you were to retire early and you're not 65 when you retire, let's say you're 40, um, you've now got a, you're not even at the midpoint in your life expectancy and you're now looking at more than half of your life having to rely on this, this system, which I would say, I mean, maybe it's a bold word, but it appears corrupt. <laughs> well... I would agree. I would say that it is really a lot more than corrupt. And, you know, and it's not even really hidden. It's just, I mean, anybody can go onto the IMF. The IMF is the International Monetary Fund. These are, and, and the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, these are the guys that are driving this bus. And the IMF, there are 195 countries in this world. 189 of them are members of the IMF. And the members, or those that attend, that are members of the IMF, is every treasury secretary and every central bank chief. So, you know, they know what's going on, let's face it. And, and again, they're the ones that are driving this bus. And you can go in and sign up for any of your areas of interest. I read their documents all the time. They tell you how they're going to take us cashless. They tell you how they're going to be able to charge us deeply negative rates. And, and I know certainly that, you know, if you're a millennial, you're the first generation that have grown up with all of this technology, not like us older people. And I also know that the more convenient, and they know this, I mean, that's why they're doing so much of this, but the more convenient it is for you to spend your money, the more of your money that you will typically spend. So uh, to, I mean, think about it. An ounce of gold is kind of heavy, right? So if you've got it in your pocket, I like the feeling of it, but it's kind of heavy. So bills were way easier to carry around than an ounce of gold. 
but hey, they made the certificate, so now you're thinking, all right, well, it's still an ounce of gold. I can go into any bank and convert it into gold. Okay, so therefore, I don't really need to hold it. I'll let them hold it. Then in the 50s, they started with the credit cards as they started, well, in the 20s, they really started to transition us into a consumer-driven economy. But in the 50s, they started with the first credit card that didn't require um, uh, collateral, right? And I mean, that's kind of like mind-blowing that you could just borrow money just with a little, you know, the back then, swish of the card. And that was pretty amazing. And that was even more convenient than carrying a wad of cash. Now with the phones, I mean, you can carry all your information, as you guys know, in one little piece that's right in your hand. And how easy is it for you to spend money that way? Right. You know, as frugal as you might think, because part of what they, the according to the data that I've read from these guys, uh, ideally, all of your equity, so if you bought a house or, or you have any equity in the stock market or whatever, if you carry it all on your phone and then you go someplace and you go, gee, I'd really like that outfit or something like that, so easy to tap in to your equity this way. So what have we been hearing? That, you know, we're going into this sharing economy. Well, and don't own anything. Own the experience, which, uh, frankly, that kills me. Own the experience. I'm not saying you shouldn't have experiences. But when you get into trouble, you can't go, oh, yeah, I know I owe you a thousand bucks, but th I had this experience over here. <laughs> Sure. You know, you can't spend an experience. So you got to have a combination, quite frankly. And in this sharing economy, what that really means is somebody's going to own everything and you're going to be renting everything. Right. Well, that's so true. You better, yeah. You better be the one to own it because whoever owns it dictates how much of that rent is. And that takes you back to owning gold so that you can actually make that happen. You're not going to do it in the stock market. Not okay. at this point, anyway. So let's talk a little bit about owning physical gold, something you can yeah. hold in your hand, as opposed to owning GLD on the markets or some sort of, a, uh, I don't know, gold in, in proxy. What's your opinion right. on that? Well, um, as a fact, so this isn't actually my opinion, and anybody can pull up the prospectus on GLD or any of the other ET, gold or silver ETFs. Okay, first of all, you do not own the gold or the silver. What you own are shares in a trust. You do not have access to the underlying asset. Plus, it is a diminishing asset because they sell off every single day, they sell off gold to pay these daily ongoing fees. So if what you're doing is trading, Frankly, it's better to trade something like that or a futures contract. It's cheaper than physical gold because physical gold takes longer. But if you're doing any of that, it's a diminishing asset. It's not, if you think it's gold or silver, it's not really gold or silver. It is a contract. Any contract runs counterparty risk. Physical gold is you, you have it. You own it outright. It runs no counterparty risk, and nobody's in there shaving off a little piece of it to pay these ongoing fees. So it is a completely different bird. I get a lot of questions about gold miners as well. Well, a gold mine stock is not gold. It is a stock and it is run by humans with that have taken on debt or whatever else they're doing. I'm not saying that it's good or it's bad. I'm just saying it's different than what you think it is. So because of where we are in this trend cycle, which is, which is we're at the end of this current, it's called a currency life cycle, and we're at the end of this currency's life cycle. Um, only holding anything that is intangible, frankly, is risky. And even dollars, you, I mean, that's still our tool of barter. So you can't just eliminate that because, frankly, if you could, I would. I'm an ex-stockbroker. Sure. I'm an ex-banker. I don't own any stocks or bonds or CDs or, or any of that crap because 
there are bail-in laws, right? right? Now, they've dismantled a lot of the protections, but they haven't dismantled the bail-in laws. And these banks are taking an awful lot of risk with your deposits. And, and even with, and I'm talking about anything that you hold at the brokerage, it's being held in street name. Look it up. Because if it's attached to a margin account, which it is, m most likely, then they have the right to utilize your equity bar and use it as collateral and borrow for their benefit. So they can borrow money with your collateral and they can do anything they want with it. If they write this contract through the City of London, which is where 99% of them are written, there are no limitations as to how many times that same collateral can be used by any number, an unlimited number of entities. So when these markets implode, I mean, 2008 isn't really that long ago and a lot of wealth evaporated and a lot of nasty, evil, vile things were done, but none of it was illegal because these are all contracts and you know who writes, who reads the contracts? Right. And by the way, you can read them on the SEC website. You can go in and they'll be, they'll tell you how many pages, 250, 350 page documents on a stock or on a bond. Mm -hmm. And they will also tell you that you are the beneficial owner. They will only take instructions from the legal registered owner. And that, the name of that company is going to be either DTC, Delaware Depository Trust, or Seed and Company, who is owned by DTC, that was created to be the legal registered owner of all this stuff. So it's not what people think it is, but that's called perception management. So you mentioned bail-ins. Um, it's yeah. not that long ago where Cyprus did exactly that. And uh, if we were to have uh, some form of additional systemic or adverse event in the United States, are you saying that any person who ho holds assets in terms of cash in a bank, stocks, uh, IRAs, um, all these sort of uh, assets could be literally just seized by the federal government? Well, actually what happens is they can be, um, okay, so it would be any deposits that you have in your checking account or savings account, plus any CDs uh, issued by the bank, or any bonds issued by the bank, uh, especially if they're called bail inable bonds, which we don't have in the US, but they have them quite a bit. They've utilized those quite extensively in Europe. But uh, yes, it, it doesn't go to the federal government. It goes into the failing bank to recapitalize it. Right. And okay. uh, the Bank for International Settlements, after they tested it in Cyprus, that was 2013. And uh, the, the first they did it without respecting the deposit insurance, okay? But the whole world went, wait a minute, what about a deposit insurance scheme? What about the deposit insurance scheme? So they backed up and they took everything that was over that in Europe, it was in Cyprus, it was $100,000 or 100,000 euros rather. So they took all the rest of it, but people did not have access more than to more than a minimum amount on a daily basis. And they only took that off in 2015. So for two years, people were basically locked out of their account. They couldn't get more than 300 bucks a day or some, you know, the equivalent, something right. like that. So the answer is yes. Now, for uh, the funds that are held in, like, say, a TD Ameritrade or something like that, okay, well, then they're held in street name. You are the beneficial owner. You are not the legal registered owner, and that's where the hypothecation comes in, and that's a different form of bail-in. But if the company goes, you know, bust, and there's nobody else to bail them out, yeah. So we're, talk done. we're talking like a... Like a Lehman Brothers or a Bear Stearns situation. Right. Got it. And so, therefore, putting all one's faith and trust in a counterparty like Vanguard or any of these fund managers, what's your opinion on that? Insanity!
humanity. Right. Because over the years, as I've watched what's going on, well, who's buying, if the normal governments and the normal entities that used to buy government bonds are not buying the government bonds, but the government's issuing an awful lot of debt, and by the way, a bond is a debt instrument. So if a government is issuing a lot of them, guess who's been buying most of them? Those institutional investors, those people that invest other people's money. Got so, it. no, I... Pff, Oh my gosh. Yeah, no. And if you're holding an IRA or something like that in Fidelity, now mind you, I haven't worked with clients in a few years now, so I, I don't know how it is, but Fidelity was absolutely the worst entity to get your money out of, your retirement money out of. Awful. Right. Three months. Three months. Wow. And you yeah, still have to amazing. bug them. That's in this environment. I'll tell you something else that's changed a lot since I was uh, since I was a stockbroker back in the 80s and 90s. I mean, if a client wanted to buy or sell or do something and um, and they decided to call, well back then you didn't do it online anyway, but you called in. I mean, you had to execute that trade bam 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 bam. That was a client instruction. You didn't dilly-dally. I mean, you would literally write that ticket and run and drop it off and they would immediately execute that trade. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken that said, "Well, my broker's on vacation or he's out today." I mean, if I wasn't available, I had an assistant, I had other brokers there, I had a manager there, somebody there would have executed that trade immediately. Immediately. So, and look at all the trouble that they're having with Robin Hood right now. Right. Right? I mean, what was kind of nice, kind of, was the ability to buy fractional shares but they're trying to do all sorts of things to keep this stock market propped up, including dropping interest rates and doing it. It's not working. Right. Got it. Well, it, I'm trying to leave our listeners with some ray of hope. And I guess one of the, one of the positive signs out of all of this is uh, I know my own gold, which I bought a number of years ago for about $1,100 an ounce, is doing pretty well right now. Uh, counter to everything else going on in the markets. Do you see that as a continuation? Do you think this is going to continue up? Right. There, there isn't even one teeny weeny little teeny doubt in my mind. Now look, it is very, very cheap to manipulate what you see on the screen. It costs $150 to control through futures contract 500 ounces of gold, which is something like Megan, you just, is she sleeping? I don't know. That was something like $800,000 or whatever. You can do the math. 500 times 1,600 is however much that is. So $150 to control all of that. So on any kind of given short-term basis, they can manipulate the price however they want. But keep in mind that when it is time for them to reset the system, there's only one way. Not, they don't have any other choices. This is the way it's been done over 4,800 times. One way to do it, and that's against gold. That's when, regardless of what Wall Street sees, and I do think we'll hit 2,000 bucks an ounce because technically there's really no resistance right now till we get to 1,800, and then the 1,900 level after that, and then after that the sky's the limit because, you know, the, the way that it technically works. So, yes, I think we could see that. I think we could see it with the way the markets are going. I mean, we've already breached the 1700 a couple of times here in these crazy markets. So, you know, we could see that, oh, crap, within a month or, you know, something <laughs> like that. But even when it hits that level, dirt cheap. And that's what anybody that really wants to build a wealth base, and, and what you're really talking about, the term is, dynastic wealth. That's wealth that lives through all of these kinds of currency regime shifts and crises and pandemics and all of that. Um, and so, yes, I'm, I'm without even one little doubt in my mind, history will repeat itself because it always does. And right. it is right now. We're at a critical time right now. Well, that's wonderful. Well, listen, I really appreciate your time and your advice is so important. I think that our listeners hear it. 
Um, how, how can they find you on the internet? Well, you know, I have a YouTube channel where, and it's really all about education. Uh, so they can either go in and put in ITM trading and you'll see my work there. I put out at least three pieces every week. And um, also, we actually love human contact. For those that want, they can call us at uh, our toll-free number is 888-696-4653. Our local number is 602-404-4010. Um, but, and they can also just go on to our website, itmtrading.com. Wonderful. All right, well, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. And uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miles. It's been great for me too.